Today marks my second academic kickoff event, and let me start by saying how honored and humbled I am to have the privilege to work with all of you here at Durham College as we continue to focus on the student experience coming first. I'm thoroughly enjoying being part of DC, and I want to thank all of you, the DC community, for continuing with the warm welcome that I'm receiving. So now to the events of this morning. It's my goal to provide you with an academic update and then for us to celebrate the start of the new semester. And how will we be celebrating? Well, I'm super excited that we'll have the opportunity to hear from an, our invited guest speaker, Jeffrey Slingo, whom I will be introducing shortly and who'll be sharing with us his thoughts, ideas, and impressions of the 21st century job market and what the future holds for our college grads. Following Jeff's presentation, we'll have several faculty members, specifically Lauren Fuentes, Anna Rodriguez, and Stephen Forbes, share with us examples of how they've successfully incorporated applied research into their classes and curriculum. First, though, I'd like to revisit some of the themes I shared with you at this time last year and that are most important to me in my role as VPA. These themes represent my strong interests and passions in education and are what we will focus on to make DC an even more incredible learning institution. So if we slip back to last year, I clustered these into five themes, including a commitment to exemplary teaching and learning, a commitment to exceptional quality in our academic programs, internationalization, intensification and strengthening of our research agenda, and the management of enrollment. Let's have a look at what we've accomplished this past year and where we're heading with each of these five themes. So in considering our first theme, the commitment to exemplary teaching and learning, we can highlight that this past year, more than 500 employees intended, attended over 110 professional development centers hosted by our Center for Academic and Faculty Enrichment, our CAFE that our Jumpstart programs saw over 160 participants. Eight faculty learning communities were initiated and supported. And our CAFE completed a needs analysis survey to ensure that we're on target to meet faculty needs. A project for this coming year that has me quite excited is our CAFE Collaboratives program. This program sees faculty members partially seconded to the CAFE to work on projects such as the indigenization of curriculum, and the development of resources to internationalize our curriculum. This fall, we'll also see some experienced faculty helping to teach some of our professional development courses at the cafe, as more opportunities are being created for faculty to share their knowledge with their peers. A strong commitment to exemplary teaching and learning at the individual and institutional levels is essential and a high priority, since it's fundamentals to ensuring high quality outcomes for our students and this will prepare for our students to succeed in life. Our second theme, our commitment to exceptional quality in our academic programs, demands the continuous update of current programs and the introduction of new programs that remain responsive to evolving student, societal, and workforce demands. Let me share with you the highlights from this past year. We've introduced a more strategic approach to new program development, looking more closely at space, budget, capital, and curriculum in this process. And we've established a five-year new program development plan. We hosted the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assurance Board, or PCABS, Quality Assurance Panel Site Visit, then submitted the college response to their report for our Honors Bachelor of Healthcare Technology Management program. We welcomed Emma Thacker, our new manager of program review and renewal to our team to streamline it and support both our annual and comprehensive program review processes. We struck a tax task force to examine our annual program review processes with recommendations to be shared in the near future. And we're launching seven new programs next week. As we look forward to the year ahead, We'll continue our preparations for our 2017 College Quality Assurance Accreditation process. We will continue our development approval processes for eight new programs to launch next year. And we will strengthen our emphasis on identifying and incorporating work-integrated learning experiences into our academic programs. 
a commitment to academic quality will have a positive impact on first choice applicants and our enrollment. Academic quality is an overriding imperative and paramount objective since program quality will drive our college's reputation. Our third theme is internationalization. This fall, we will be welcoming over 550 international students from over 42 countries. These students are drawn to DC by our strong academic programs and our growing global reputation. It has been a busy year for our international education team. We have begun the process of developing our institution's first comprehensive internationalization and global engagement plan. We have established a Leave for Change program here at DC, which will allow employees to consider participating in overseas development projects. We very successfully hosted the Ontario Association of International Education Conference in May, welcoming 140 international educators from across the province. Since June of 2015, 10 DC faculty and staff have implemented nine international training missions alongside our partners in Guyana, Peru, Barbados, and Vietnam. And we've added new elements to our welcome and orientation sessions for our international students to ensure they get started on a good foot. Over this coming year, we will see the launch of an international and global engagement advisory committee, a committee that will help further shape the direction of international initiatives at DC to build a quality international and global engagement process that serves the socio-cultural, economical, and educational needs of the college community. Our internationalization efforts are a definite priority. Our students will live and work in a globalized society. We must give our students the tools, understanding, and experience they require to succeed in this changing world. Our fourth theme is the intensification and strengthening of our research agenda. And there have been many exciting developments in applied research over the last several months. Let me begin by sharing that a new brew line was installed at the Whippy campus to support our applied research plant plans with local craft breweries. And I'm pleased to share that we're in the final stages of licensing that brew line and set to begin brewing beer and working on applied research projects this fall. As well, there's even more on beer. <laughs> As well, we're establishing a microbiology lab to facilitate research on beer quality and consistency. So yes, perhaps this is research that some of you might enjoy participating in. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from beer, we, have, we also have researchers working with students on a pest management strategy involving local apple orchards. And several projects have been running with computer programming and electronics faculty researchers. To support our growing applied research efforts, I'm pleased to share that as of this year, every school has a research coordinator. This fall, our seven research coordinators, along with the applied research team in ORSI, will be working hard to identify even more ways of supporting local companies and providing our students with meaningful experiential learning opportunities. Our aim of our research agenda is, and will continue to be, to further enhance the educational experience by integrating applied research into curriculum. Students who engage in applied research acquire real-life learning that may help employers stay competitive. Finally, fifth is our theme of the management of enrollment. This past year, we've seen the relaunch of an Institutional Enrollment Advisory Committee, or EAC, and four working groups that support this committee. The mandate of the EAC is to recommend annual and long-term evidence-based enrollment goals that will shape a diverse student population to achieve institutional strategic goals. This group will be working diligently this fall semester to establish our enrollment goals, identify the major objectives and strategies to accomplish these goals, and finalize an enrollment plan. The working groups of the EAC will then begin the task of implementing the plan and then monitoring and evaluating the plan's outcomes. Successful enrollment management is an intensive and an intentional process. This work takes effort, patience, and perseverance but it can be transformative for institutions. We need to plan thoughtfully and strategically to ensure long-term institutional health, the changing demographic profile of our students, declining traditional college-age students, and resource capacities all demand that we continue to consider enrollment management as a priority as we move forward. 
This rounds out my five themes, the themes that I look forward to working with all of you on in the next few years as we continue to build on our strengths. In the coming months, we will all have an opportunity to further shape DC's future as we begin the process of developing our next strategic plan and also as we refresh our academic direction or academic plan. As we refresh our academic plan, we'll take the time to reflect, assess, and engage in dialogue about where we are and our aspirations for our next phase. I hope you all contribute and participate with these important processes as they are key to DC becoming even more of a success story. So please do stay tuned for details on how you can be involved. But now, let's turn our attention to our guest speaker, Jeffrey Selegno. As is highlighted in the front cover of Jeffrey's book, There Is Life After College, earning a credential is to be a near guarantee of financial stability and professional opportunity. Graduates left college with a freshly minted diploma and were set in motion on a promising career path. Youth in Canada today have more formal education than ever. 64% of adults hold post-secondary qualifications, yet their labor market outcomes have worsened. Let's compare a 13% youth versus a 6.7% adult unemployment rate in January of this year. Thus, there's a growing concern about the transition from school to work. And our challenge as educators is to best prepare our students for, that, for the rapid economic and social change we're experiencing and for a workforce full of intense competition. Colleges, in DC in particular, have a strong track record in training people for employability. But let's take this opportunity to further evolve and bolster our students' skills to succeed in the workplace. With parents, students, and politicians increasingly focused on the return on investment of a college credential, Jeff offers a hopeful, inspiring blueprint for how students can make the most of their undergraduate years and how colleges and universities will evolve to better meet the needs of the 21st century. Jeff has written about higher education for two decades and is the author of three books. His latest book, There Is Life After College, was a New York Times bestseller. A regular contributor to the Washington Post, Jeff is a special advisor and professor of practice at Arizona State and a visiting scholar at Georgia Tech Center for 21st Century Universities. He is the former top editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education, where he worked for 16 years in a variety of reporting and editing roles. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Slate, and he's a contributor to LinkedIn, which you can follow his blog posts about higher education. Jeff's work has been honored with awards from the Education Writers Association, Society of Professional Journalists, and the Associated Press. He has been the keynote speaker before dozens of associations and institutions, and appears regularly on regional and national radio and television programs. Please help me welcome Jeff to our stage to share fresh new insights with us. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's terrific uh, to be here um, and to kick off your, your new academic. Sorry. Technology. Are we good to go? Sorry. Um, it's great to be here to kick off your, your new academic uh, year. You know, events like this, I think, perhaps, um, are, are wonderful and perhaps even therapeutic <laughs> uh, because they remind us of, uh, of new beginnings um, that you can start over and probably most of all of the new challenges that await all of you um, in the year uh, in the year uh, in the year ahead. Uh, um, today I'm going to be talking about my my book um, There is Life After College and my hope is to to challenge you um, on the purpose of post-secondary education and how we deliver it to a new generation of students in a very new economy that probably none of us really understand, where learning is always on. It's not just something you dip in and dip out of when you, when you want. I'm also glad to be here in Ontario, uh, Ontario if only because your weather is much better uh, than where I came from in the hot and humid uh, Washington, uh, D.C. 
Uh, you probably know that I'm a, a U.S. citizen, and if you read the book, it's really from a, an American uh, perspective. But the issues and the data points that I'll be talking about today are really global in nature. Um, and this is a global problem that countries around the world um, are facing. Now, I understand the differences between our respective post-secondary uh, education systems, um, but I hope that you will excuse me because once in a while I have covered higher education in the U.S. for 20 years, so once in a while I might uh, go back to the lingo of, uh, of the American system, and I apologize uh, in advance. Old habits are, are tough uh, to break. Um, but, uh, but I'm really excited to be here today, and, and I encourage you to, to tweet or Facebook or whatever you want to do during this uh, uh, during this presentation because I do want to share this message um, uh, with everybody. Um, I also, I want to start today by uh, sharing a story from a, a much earlier trip uh, to Canada. Sorry, there we go. Um, I want to start off by, uh, today by sharing a much earlier trip that I took to Canada many years ago when I went skiing, when I was invited uh, to go skiing by a friend of mine at, at Whistler in uh, British Columbia. Now, I learned to ski when I was five years old, but I had never been skiing out west. I grew up in skiing in the mountains of, of Pennsylvania, um, or I was, as I was about to discover, the hills of, of Pennsylvania, the tiny hills of Pennsylvania. Now, we arrived uh, at Whistler at night, and so by the next morning, I was anxious to, to get started. And we jumped onto gondola, and uh, as we got to the top of the mountain, my friend turned to me and he said, just so you know, we're going to be skiing in a bowl. Now, I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was about to find out. So we got off the gondola, and I looked around, and it was as if I had never been skiing before in my life. We were in a large mountain bowl, and all the skiers out there know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And all I saw, for as far as I can see, was snow, deep, powdery snow that in Many cases came all the way up to my knee. Now, where I skied growing up, it was pretty straightforward, right? You get off the ski lift, you look right, you look left. There was a couple of carefully marked trails, right? It was packed powder snow, um, and it was pretty easy to, to get down, and it was very well-groomed. Well, here, there were no trails, there were no packed snow, and there were certainly no trees to help guide me. Right? It was not the familiar scene of my childhood. I was in deep snow, and I turned to my friend, and I said, I can't do it. Right? So he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'll walk down. And I started taking off my skis. Now, he looked around, and he laughed just like you did, because as far as the eye can see, we could not see the bottom of the mountain. And he had no idea how I was going to walk down this mountain. I was stuck right? And there was only one way down, and that was to have him carefully guide me. Now, I had been skiing hundreds of times in my life, and it was as if I was learning to ski all over again, decades after I had first learned. But my friend taught me how to maneuver, and eventually we made our way down the mountain. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because in this 21st century economy for new college graduates, it's much like that mountain bowl that I skied that day at Whistler. It's wide open. It's not well marked. It puts them in very unfamiliar situations like I was in that day. And it's incredibly difficult to navigate. But it's not impossible. That's me. I eventually made it down the hill. Uh, in, into the bottom of the hill. You know, over the last few decades, parents, students, counselors have focused, in my mind, way too much effort on the college search, right? But not enough on what happens afterwards, once students arrive here as they are over the next couple of weeks, and how they're going to spend those precious late teenage and 20-something years that they have. Today, how you go to college, from choosing a major to finding internships, increasingly plays a, large, a much larger role than where you decide to go to college. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to challenge your thinking about what we mean by post-secondary education 
in the 21st century and how I think it needs to respond to the student and the economic needs of this global changing economy. But first, I want to return by going back in time to another century. Right? The education system we have today has its roots in the 18th and 19th centuries, right? where a lot of the structure of the education system that we have today was imported from somewhere else. Right? Other countries that developed it, and then we decided to import it to our country. Right? Even Harvard University, which everybody likes to copy, started with a three-year degree when they first were created. And a couple of years later, they decided to go to a four-year degree, and so everybody else in the US followed them. Because even then, everybody wanted to be like Harvard. Right? The early post-secondary curriculum in most countries was quite limited. Right? It was designed to educate a small number of people, and it really consisted only of a few courses. Right? Because we were only training mostly lawyers and ministers and statesmen. Right? So there were things like grammar and astronomy, arithmetic and, and music. Most people entered careers through apprenticeships, where they studied with master teachers and practiced new skills as they learned them. Now over time, at this time, only a small slice of the population went to college. And the degree, the diploma at that time, was certainly not the admission ticket it is today. And it has been for the last few decades to a specific job. Now, the pathway that was created centuries ago was never designed to serve the millions of students it serves today of varying academic capabilities and professional interests, right? It was really designed for a very certain type of student and for a lot fewer of them. And now we push millions of students with varying academic capabilities and professional interests through this one pipeline that was created centuries ago. So we shouldn't be surprised that so many young adults have trouble navigating their 20s today. At the same time, the world of work has changed. Right? There's a new normal in the workplace. We have much more complex, fragmented workplace with many overlapping pathways about how you get through jobs. Right? In this economy, as you know, entire industries, entire careers expand and contract at an alarming pace. Law, accounting, even medicine are no longer the steady career paths that they once were. Today, 50% of jobs that we have today are threatened by automation in the coming decades, according to a recent study by Oxford University. Show of hands, how many of you would recommend accounting to your students today? How many? OK, you still would, right? I wish uh, this is hard to see because it's cut off on the left side here. But 94%, 94% is the, is the probability that accounting is going to be automated in the next couple of decades, right? So maybe they all should become athletic trainers, right, which only has a 0.07% of that happening in the next uh, couple of decades. But in this new economy, the basic foundation of our post-secondary education system, which was constructed for, this 18th, for the 18th century, no longer cuts it. Right? Even as the needs of employers have changed, the post-secondary education system still clings to its historical mission in most places. Right? Too many students today lack the necessary coping skills to navigate this new workforce that we have today. Right? And they end up working for employers that are no longer willing to invest in them and invest in training in them. For them, for students of today, the goalposts have moved, right? And as a result, in my mind, we need to rethink the post-secondary system in general, right? We need to evaluate as college leaders, counselors, and teachers what kind of education is needed after high school to succeed in this evolving global information economy. And we need to stop thinking of the post-secondary education system as this box you enter at one time in your life, you spend a couple of years there, 
and then suddenly you're ready for the workforce, right? We need to rethink post-secondary education as a platform for lifelong learning, where the transitions in and out of it are much more gradual. Students today face careers as wide open as the vast oceans around the world. And what we need to do as educators is provide them with the navigational charts that will help them find their way in this new economy. Now, over the last two years, as part of the research for my new book, There is Life After College, I interviewed hundreds of students and dozens of employers of all kinds, right? From government agencies and nonprofits to big for-profit global companies. From the hot companies of, uh, that are hiring on the campus recruiting circuit, from places like Facebook and Google and Pinterest, and the stalwarts of those campus recruiting circuits, those companies that show up year after year, including Enterprise Rent-A-Car, which hires more college graduates around the world than any other company, than any other company. And what I found is that they're not always looking for the hard skills that we hear so often, right? It's not that many of the new graduates that they're hiring are missing those hard skills. But what I heard over and over again is that students are missing the so-called soft skills. Now, you've probably heard this many times, right? Those soft skills, uh, the term of how people get along with each other, right? How they communicate with each other, how they problem solve. In many ways, I start to think we should stop calling these the soft skills, right? Because they're really hard to teach. They're incredibly hard to teach to students of all ages. And in this 21st century economy, in my mind, soft skills are more critical for today's college graduates than ever before. Because in many ways, they're all about knowing the human touch and complementing technology. So in the race between humans and technology, in my mind, the humans who possess these strong soft skills are going to be the winners in the end, right? They're going to be the ones with those jobs that are not going to be displaced by technology because they're going to know that human touch and they're going to be able to communicate and problem solve. Now, these are the five skills that I heard over and over again that employers want in new college graduates. And all of them are soft skills for the most part, and probably none of them will surprise most of you in this room. Let's start with the most important, which is curiosity, right? And I want to, we need to really turn students into learning animals because learning today is not something that you turn off or turn on, right? Learning is always happening and lifelong education is no longer a rhetoric that we talk about, but the reality that is now here, right? And we need to arm students to answer questions that haven't even been asked yet, right? To solve problems that we don't even know we have yet, right? Most industries are changing so fast that students can't depend on something that they learn at the age of 18 and then walk away at the age of 22 or 25, right? We exercise our bodies throughout our lives, or at least most of us do, I guess, right? To keep in shape. We don't just go to the gym for two years or four years at the age of 18 and hope that our body will be healthy for the rest of our lives, if only, right? That would be great news, right? We exercise those bodies throughout our lives, and we also need to exercise our brains throughout our lives, right? We need to think of learning in the same way. It's constantly exercising those learning muscles. The second critical skill is creativity. I apologize for uh, some of the slides being, being cut off, but I'll, I'll share them uh, with everybody. The second critical skill is, is creativity because jobs and careers today are ambiguous, right? And a 22-year-old or a 25-year-old college graduate is no longer depending on someone else to direct learning for them. Think about it. When kids get to college, for the most part, someone else has directed learning for them from the moment they were born, right? It was a parent, a teacher, a counselor, and then they get to college and someone else here directs learning for them, right? And then they're put out into the workforce. 
And no one else is going to direct learning for them. Once in a while, an employer will. But they're going to have to figure out the skills that they need on their own and the education that they're going to need on their own. And they're going to need that creativity to figure that out. Now, this is a generation that has been born and raised on all technology tools. But what's amazed me as I met many students, and you probably have met many of these students as well, is that they mostly have a passive relationship with technology, right? They're always looking at those devices, as many of us are. But most of them do not know how those devices work, right? Today, every job is a tech job. Now, that doesn't mean everybody needs to learn how to code necessarily. But everybody needs to understand the lingo, the language of technology. They need to understand how technology works. Even in my own profession of journalism, which has changed drastically over the last decade. And as you know, there are fewer journalists today than there were 10 years ago. But there is one growth area in journalism where there is a desperate need for more journalists who know how to crunch data, for data journalists, who are able to see patterns in large data sets and figure out how to tell stories in those data sets. Right? That is a growth area. And in, many, every, in every career, there is a job that technology is required and we need to start to show students that they need to have more than just this passive relationship with technology. Now to me, the killer app of the 21st century is what I call contextual thinking, right? Students need to have both the breadth and depth to understand how the world works today. In the book, I call this the connective tissue between formal learning in the classroom and the informal learning outside the classroom. And how students are able to connect these dots is going to become critical as jobs become more ambiguous and as careers become more ambiguous. And if we can help students connect those dots, we will arm them with the success that they're going to need in this 21st century. Because too often, I fear that students are encouraged to be well-rounded. Right? We hear this often. And the problem with well-rounded students usually is that they don't focus on any one thing for a prolonged period of time. Too often they seem to participate in activities just to check off a series of boxes. Right? In instead of showing some deep and sustained involvement, passion, or dedication to something. And that's what employers are seeking. Too often employers told me they see resumes of students who essentially signed up for a club just to say they did it, right? What they refer to as sign-up clubs, right? To say, well, I did that. But they never had that deep, sustained involvement. Now, these jack-of-all-trades were useful in previous generations, but de these days they're missing that deep expertise of what is often referred to as the T-shaped individual, right? Having both the breadth and the depth in something. And it's key that we provide students with this contextual thinking. And then finally, probably the skill that is familiar to most of you in this room, if you've worked for st with students over the last couple of years, and I heard this over and over again from employers over the last couple of months, and that is humility, right? Because you're not gonna be promoted the second day on the job, as many of today's young graduates want. Now these Five critical skills that I heard over and over again from employers um, really mirror the findings that came out of Burning Glass last year. Now, Burning Glass is a company based out of Boston, and they do data analytics around job ads. And what they did last year was that they surveyed, they scraped 20 million job ads around the world. And what they wanted to find out in scraping those job ads is they wanted to find out what are the skills what are the baseline skills that get students hired in the job market today? Now, obviously, if you've ever applied for a job or advertised for a job, you know that jobs don't list every single skill necessary, right? You're mostly going to list skills that you don't typically get in new employees or typically don't get in employers. What they found in scraping 20 million job ads is that in three out of every four, three out of every four job ads, just 25 skills kept appearing 
over and over again. 25 skills. It didn't matter the occupation. It didn't matter the industry. The same skills showed up over and over again. Virtually every job posting, 20 million again, virtually every job posting had the same top five skills listed in them. And what were they? And again, I'll, I'll read these off. I'm sorry that, is there any way we could get that screen any smaller? I'll let them work on that in the back. But um, the top five skills in every job posting, and the, again, these are going to sound familiar, and they're all soft skills, right? Communication and writing, organizational skills, customer service, problem solving, planning, and detail-oriented appeared in almost every single job ad. There was one hard skill that appeared in every single job ad. Can anybody guess what it might have been? Microsoft Excel, right? So my advice to any 20-something, no matter what your major, if you know how to use Microsoft Excel, you're going to be okay on the, on the job market uh, uh, today, right? The soft skills, why did, these soft skills kept, why did these soft skills keep appearing over and over again in these job ads? It's because employers don't trust that the credential coming out of colleges today is embedded with the soft skills like it used to be, right? The diploma, the credential coming out of college today is still the strongest job signal, is still the some strongest signal that somebody is ready for a job today, but increasingly it has a lot of noise around it. And employers no longer trust it. And it also sends, that sends mixed signals to today's college students about what they need to better prepare for the workforce. And this is because traditional education, that traditional education system that I was describing earlier, rarely emphasizes these soft skills, these social skills, so important in the modern workplace. In many ways, the modern workplace looks a lot like a preschool classroom where curiosity, sharing, and negotiating are front and center. Right? When I was writing this book, my oldest daughter, who is now seven years old, was in uh, pre-kindergarten, junior kindergarten. And her school had just completed this large construction project. And as a result, it had dozens of packing boxes left over from some new furniture. Uh, that, they, that they got in. Now, instead of taking those boxes to, a, uh, to the recycling bin, they let my daughter's class, which is right here, they let them loose in that room for a while, right? And the kids built a fort, right? They built a town. They constructed a school. It was the highlight of the week, perhaps the month for my daughter. She couldn't stop talking about what could be built with a bunch of boxes. And I said, well, this is great. That's what you're getting for your birthday, right? You're going to just get a plain brown box, paper box, right? And I wondered out loud when she was telling me the story, what would happen if we put a bunch of teenagers, a bunch of college students in that same room that those five-year-olds were in? What would happen? Now, they would ask plenty of questions, of course, but probably much more about the process than the possibilities of what could be made, right? What's the assignment? Do we need to work in teams? How do we pick teams? When do we need to finish this project? And most of all, if we put a bunch of teenagers or college students in that room, what's the number one question that most of them would ask? How are we going to get graded on this assignment, right? They're going to want to know the outcome. My daughter's class never asked any of those questions. It was all about what could be made with those, with those boxes. Now, in this 21st century education, in this 21st century, our education system, in many ways, is too much like the workplace of old, the workplace that we're transitioning away from, where punctuality, attention to detail, and silence were valued above all else, right? Even College today is very task-based, right? Think about the academic year you're about to enter. It's all about taking a class, finishing an exam, finishing a paper, attending a club meeting, right? Going to practice. A handful of colleges have even built electronic advising systems that help students 
pick their classes based on the success of students before them who had similar grades to them, right? But today's workplace is much like the preschool that my daughter goes to, right? Where it's unstructured. It has competing priorities and decisions that need to be made on the fly. It's a mashup of activities with no scheduled end. And as the head of learning, as the head of global learning at Xerox told me, today's college graduates know how to take a course, but they need to learn how to learn, right? They know how to take a course, but they need to learn how to learn. Now, John Lutner, who's the head of global learning at Xerox, told me a couple of years ago, he surveyed his new employees around the world who were recent, all of them who were recent college graduates, and he asked them what professional development opportunities they wanted on the job, on the new job. The number one course they wanted was a course in time management. He was shocked, right? These were recent college graduates. He thought they should know how to manage time. But what he realized after he asked a few new hires, well, why do you want a course in time management, is that in college, and in their life up to this point, someone set priorities for them, right? And now they were on a job and they didn't know how to set their own priorities. We're not graduating students who are prepared to navigate the ambiguity of today's workforce. And that's what we need to know today. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, I'll go back now and start over again. But um, anyway, now you can see the, the rest of these slides. Anyway, we're not navigating, we're not helping students navigate. And we know this from a number of academic studies over the last uh, couple of years, right? A third of students today had no learning gains after a couple of years of college, according to the two sociologists who wrote the book, Academically Adrift, right? 40% of college seniors failed to graduate with the complex reasoning skills, according to the collegiate learning exam. I witnessed this firsthand when I was reporting the book. I went out to see Rick Setterstein, who is a professor at, uh, at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. Right? And he's an expert on adolescence. And I wanted to find out how today's adolescents are moving into adulthood and this idea of delayed adulthood uh, that many of you and many of you probably have kids know about. Right? And I wanted to find out, how has this happened? What's the history of this? And so Rick invited me to sit in on one of his classes, a group of seniors who have now spent four years at, the, uh, at Oregon State University. And it was a class on critical thinking. And it was a large lecture class. There were probably about uh, 80 to 90 people in the class. And he invited me to sit in on this class. And, um, and at some point, the conversation turned to life after college. Now, these were seniors in college in the fall of their senior year. And the conversation turned about what they were going to do afterwards. And, and he asked, how many of you want to go on to graduate or professional school after uh, college? And most of the hands in the room, uh, quite surprisingly, about 75 to 80% of the hands in the room uh, went up. And then he said, how many of you know a professor well enough to ask for a recommendation for graduate school? So 75% of the hands, again, almost 100 kids in this class, went up. How many hands do you think went up when he asked you how, how, how many of you know a professor well enough? There were two or three hands that went up. Right? He was shocked. He was like, how do you get through four years of college and not know how to navigate this institution? And he said, how many of you gone to office hours for a professor and visited with them? And, and they said, well, we didn't know we could do that unless we had a problem. Right? Right? They only thought they would go to office hours with, uh, with, uh, when there was a problem, right? So they've gone through four years, and, and the conversation turned to how they navigate the institution up to that point. And what he realized is that no one ever told them how to navigate this institution, right? And this is becoming critical as around the world, many students are going to college who are first generation, right? They, they don't have parents and others who help direct them on this pathway through college. And this is not true, by the way, just at, Oregon State University, right? The findings from the National Survey of Student Engagement found that 50% of college students, only 50% say they've talked often with a faculty member about their career plans by the time they're a senior, right? Too many students wait for college to happen to them, right? They treat college as a spectator sport and depend on their, those years of college to spoon feed them the experiences that will shape them 
for the future. As Rick Setterstein told me that day, there are things you are taught and then there are things you learn in college. And a lot of what happens in college comes down to not what happens in the classroom, but it's about navigating and building those skills and those relationships for the future. How, today's, how do today's adults navigate this life? How do they navigate this life and build these relationships? How do they launch into their 20s? How many of you in this room have people in their late, 20, late teens and 20s? Okay, a decent amount. And obviously everybody in this room knows somebody in their late teens and, and 20s. Well, for many of them you know this is not an easy transition, nor is it seamless. Nearly 50% of American 20-somethings, and this is true all around the world actually, they're underemployed, right? They're in jobs that don't require a post-secondary education. They're in jobs that only require a high school diploma. In 1983, the average age of financial independence for somebody in their 20s was 26. That's when they were able to live on their own, right? How many of you have 20-something still living at home? You want to get rid of them, right? You ready? Well, don't be too quick about it because the average age of financial independence is now 30, according to the Georgetown Center on Education in the Workforce. That's when students around the world reach the median wage in their country on average, right? That's when they reach the median wage and they're able to kind of, quote unquote, live on their own. So for this book, I wanted to understand the experiences that shaped people in those formative years of their 20s, right? So I had a survey firm conduct a survey of people in their 20s, and I wanted to know how they launched. What are the experiences they had, for example, between the ages of 16 and 17 and the age of 25? What experiences did they have that allowed them to be where they are today in their mid-20s? And I found, and this forms the first chapter of the book, I found that today's 20-somethings launch into adulthood in one of three ways. They're either sprinters, they're wanderers, or they're stragglers. And most of you in this room who know 20-somethings or have 20-somethings probably could put your own kids in one of those three uh, buckets. Now, sprinters, they jump right in, right? into their career after college, and they're on a pathway to a successful launch after completing additional uh, education. Determination and experience mark, uh, mark are markers of sprinters. Now, we think that most people will launch from college this way, but the fact of the matter is that only about a third of students launch from college this quickly, are sprinters. Now, wanderers, meanwhile, they take their time. Right? About half of their 20s to get going. Students, by the way, who drift through post-secondary education are more likely to become wanderers after, um, after higher education. And then finally, we have the stragglers. Right? And they press pause on their 20s. They spend most of their 20s figuring out what their career and what their job is going to be. Delay and indecisiveness are key markers of stragglers and they make up about a third of 20-somethings. That means two-thirds of young adults today, two-thirds of young adults today are struggling to launch into a career. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with being a wanderer or a straggler, right? As long as you know the risks, and more important, as long as you're willing to invest more in your human capital to get going. Now, whether somebody becomes a sprinter, a wanderer, or a straggler on their journey through their 20s actually depends on three factors on decisions that they made much earlier on, on decisions that they made when they were 16, when they were 18, and when they were 20. And that puts them on a pathway to one of, their three, one of these three buckets. There are three factors that define their years after high school that really define whether they're going to become a sprinter, a wanderer, or a straggler. The first is debt and how much debt they have. The more debt that students have coming out of college, the more likely they are to become a wanderer or a straggler. Now, why is that? Because debt really limits 
their ability to be flexible in the job market of today, right? They can't move anywhere around a country or around the world, right? They can't take low paid jobs because uh, to get experience because they need to pay off their debt or start to pay off their debt, right? And that debt becomes the, so much of the focus of what they do after college rather than the job that will lead to a better career down the roadway. The second are internships. And this is really the critical finding of the book in that nearly 80% of sprinters had at least one internship in college, where only about half of wanderers had an internship in college. And why is this important? Because today, employers hire as full-time workers about 50% of the interns who had worked for them before they graduated. And at some companies, and in some industries, the number's even much higher. It's 75 to 80% of their new hires come through their internship pools. Internships in, really, in many ways are now a critical cog in the recruiting wheel of companies. Because in, increasingly, increasingly, employers want to know if students are job ready. Right? They want to know, most important, do students have those soft skills that we talked about earlier that employers increasingly don't think are embedded in the degree anymore. And so in many ways, they want to try them out. Try them out through an internship before they hire them on full time. And the result of this is that college students can no longer wait to start getting those internships and start getting that valuable work experience. And I know that you have those valuable work experiences here at, at Durham College, but too many institutions really see those years of college as focused on classroom learning and not a nice mixture, as one of your students on one of these posters over here said, of both theory in the classroom and practice on the job, right? I heard from so many career counselors on campuses about how companies continue to move up the recruiting calendar earlier and earlier so they can start identifying talent for their companies much earlier, right? The recruiting, the head of, uh, of the campus recruiting center at the University of Pennsylvania told me that there used to be a time where 50 employers came to recruit for interns. And today, today they have more than 180 companies recruiting only for interns. I asked her how many of those return to recruit for full-time employees later on? Fewer than half, right? Because they have essentially hired all of their new employees through their internship program. And this is critical, and many students do not know this when they enter college and when they enter academic um, programs. Finally, the third factor, so debt and internships, two important ways on how students launch into their, in their 20s. The third is the credential itself, right? It still matters in the job market. Don't believe any of those technology people who say skip college, you know, become the next Bill Gates, the next Steve Jobs, the next Mark Zuckerberg, right? Very few people actually do that, right? You still need that credential, and it's still very valued in the marketplace, which is very good for institutions like yours, right? That credential still matters in the marketplace. But the problem is, is that too many students are attempting post-secondary education and are leaving without that credential. And in fact, around the world today, there are more people in their 20s, there are more people in their 20s with some credit post-secondary credit and no degree than there are people in any other age group around the world in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. So we have a massive number of people in their 20s who are struggling to launch because they have, they've attempted college, but they never finished. And as you know from looking at any job ad, very few job ads say some college credit required no degree, right? They want that degree. They want that diploma there in order to hire those students. So I just laid out the problems, right? I want to end today before I open it up for some questions about what we should do, 
What should we do about this? How should we create a 21st century education system that better prepares students for the world they're going to face? And this is the challenge that I want to lay out to you as you begin your new academic year, as you welcome students over these next couple of weeks and how to prepare them. Now, I want to offer three suggestions in particular today about how I think, and I lay these out in the book, about how I think we can better prepare students. The first is fail fast and fail cheap, right? Now, you probably have heard this mantra before. It's a, it's a saying that a lot of startup companies, a lot of entrepreneurs have, right? And the idea is, you know, tweak your, continue to tweak your idea before you spend too much money, um, time or money, right, on your new idea. Now, students, though, rarely see good models of failure in their lives. And why is that? Because as parents and teachers, we f usually hide our mistakes, right? Usually hide your mistakes from your children. You probably hide your mistakes from your students in class. Instead, students are encouraged to follow successful examples. You know, even as students search for colleges, they're always shown successful graduates of those colleges. Now, I'm not encouraging you to showcase all the failures that have come out of Durham College, right? But if students only see models of success, how do they know all the trials and errors that make up most careers, right? Because I bet you most of you in this room have had failures throughout your lives that have really taught you not only the power of resilience, but have really enabled you to be where you are today. Right? And students rarely see that. They rarely see the trial and error that make up the re end result of good careers. They're only shown the final answer to a problem. Right? They rarely see the awful drafts of writers. Right? They only read the final book or the final report. Right? They never know the process that got somebody to that point. I teach writing at Arizona State, and I all the time share my own awful drafts. I kept all the drafts of this book that was finalized because I wanted students to see the recipe that went into that final product. Right? I wanted them to see that even the best writers in the world don't just sit down and write that best-selling best -selling book. Right? In many ways, the fear of failure, as you know, starts in childhood now. As I said, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, and I'm the dad on the playground who sits there at the end of that slide when they're coming down, afraid they're going to fall, right? So what did I do a couple weeks ago? I decided to let my child on those monkey bars, right, to maybe let them, let them fail a little bit. My younger daughter fell and broke her arm. So now, of course, I'm going to be that helicopter parent the next time she gets up on those monkey bars, and I'm not going to let her fail. But we all do it, right? We all do it. And, this, and school, school of all kinds, really reinforces this message of this fear of failure in students with high-stakes testing, right? As the head of recruiting at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, remember I told you, Enterprise Rent-A-Car hires more college graduates around the world than any other company. She told me this is a generation that has been syllabus through their lives, right? It's one of the reasons that Enterprise likes to hire former college athletes. You've probably seen an Enterprise television commercial that showcases former college athletes. Why do they like to hire former college athletes? Because for the most part, they probably have lost more than they won, right? They show up on time even when they don't want to because they had, used to have to show up to practice at 4 o'clock in the morning or at 9 o'clock at at night, and they're, they have this ability to juggle multiple things, right? It's why the head of university partnerships at IBM told me that today he would rather hire somebody from a failed startup than a new college graduate because somebody from a failed startup has, has already experienced that failure, right? And in, in to him, he's less interested in the big successes of students, and they like to tout them in interviews. Because to him, people don't learn a lot from their successes, and they usually learn the wrong things. So think about, as you start this academic year, how can you model failure for students more often, both inside and the outside the classroom? Second, how can we put students to work in more relevant jobs before college and while getting a degree? 
today in school, so many teenagers are overscheduled or they're focused on becoming pro athletes, uh, even at the age of five these days, right? That, uh, and the job market for teenagers is terrible around the world, that most of them don't work before they go to college, right? In the, in the U.S., um, in the U.S., when I graduated from college, 40% of teenagers had some sort of job while they went to school, right? In 2016, only 20% do, right? Only 20% do. I was fascinated over the last couple of weeks, if, you, if you're on social media, there was the hashtag first seven jobs, right? People were talking about their first seven jobs. Now, most of my feeds are people in their 40s and 50s and plus, right? And I was interested, you know, it was the usual, you know, fast food or newspaper delivery or mowing lawns. And then eventually it would get into their, you know, the early part of their career. I started to wonder if we see that hashtag a decade from now or two decades from now, what would that look like, right? What would those first seven jobs look like? So we need to figure out how to put students in more relevant jobs early on. Because those jobs, whether they're in high school or college, think about your own first jobs, right? My first job in a hospital cafeteria, right, where I worked with people of multiple generations, where I learned the power and the ethic of work, uh, where I learned how to show up on time, right, where I learned I wasn't going to get promoted on my second day of work, right. It, it offers those soft skills at a very early age. And what I found, one of the reasons why many companies want to hire their interns is because for the most part, for many students, that's their first work experience, right. Their first work experience is in college or after college. And so the question is, how do we put more students in these relevant work experiences while they're in colleges? And to me, too many institutions have a strong bias against working while in college. And my feeling after writing this book is that those two approaches, right, we're either educating students or training them for a job. I don't understand why we can't do both, right? And to me, the best post-secondary education is that two-pronged approach that has, as the student over there said, both the theory and the practice. You know, there's nothing wrong with going to college for learning's sake, but students today really need to resist the pool of schools that only want them to focus on the academic side and not put those theories into practice. Now, if students don't get that work experience in college, what's going to happen is they end up going out into the workforce and they, they're like somebody like R.J. Dabber, who I profiled in my book. Now, he graduated from Wesleyan University in Connecticut, a well-regarded liberal arts college with a degree in math. And he said, I have a STEM degree, right? Everybody's telling me to get a STEM degree. I got a STEM degree. He started going for jobs and he couldn't find one. So a couple of weeks after graduation, he enrolled at General Assembly which is one of these coding boot camps, and there's now dozens of these coding boot camps. He took an 11-week coding boot camp. A week after he finished that boot camp, he applied for a job and got it. And it was only about a month on the job that his boss even realized he had a college degree. Right? Now, increasingly, these boot camps are part of what I call a new learning economy that is competing with traditional higher education. They're part of this new learning economy that goes beyond what traditional colleges and universities do and really rethinks the idea of what is needed in the workforce of today. So rather than plug into formal learning opportunities that most of us did, right, when we didn't have something after college, we would go back to college, right, we'd get another diploma, another degree, we'd go to a professional school. Rather than that, Students today, new graduates today, are increasingly navigating this new learning economy with what I call just-in-time learning, right? And they're, whether they're the MOOCs or the lynda.coms of the world or the general assemblies of the world, right? Think about how we learn in our own day-to-day -to -day life today, right? If you don't know how to cook a recipe or how to repair something in your house, what do you do? You jump on YouTube, you Google it, you jump on YouTube and you watch a five minute video. And suddenly you're an expert, right? But that's what increasingly training post higher education, it won't replace higher education, but increasingly that is what lifelong education is going to look like in this new world, right? Where students are gonna plug into 
this both formal learning economy that you operate here, but also this informal learning economy that has been created over the last couple of years. And some institutions are already figuring out how can we get in on this informal learning economy. And one of them is Stanford University. So Stanford University, two years ago, had a design competition to reimagine undergraduate education in the year 2025. And they came up with this idea of the open loop university. And the idea is that instead of being accepted to four years of education at Stanford at the age of 18, you would get accepted for six years. And here's the key. You could use any time throughout your life. And so the idea is that you could use these six years any time you want it. You could start, start in. After two years, you could go work for that Silicon Valley startup. And then when that failed, you could come back to school right, to finish up. And the idea is that you would continue to come back and to learn throughout your life because that's what's going to be needed. Remember what I told you earlier. We need to stop thinking of post-secondary education as this platform I'm sorry, as this box that you enter and exit at a certain point in your life, but rather as a platform for lifelong learning. Now, finally, finally, I want to talk about how we need to slow down the conveyor belt that we have many students on. One of the reasons why many students are struggling to launch in their 20s is because we still think life should be like it was in the 16th and 17th century, right? We still think, or even back in the 1930s and 40s, right, when students graduated from school, they went to college for a couple of years, they graduated from college and went right into a job, and, and they probably worked in that job, in that occupation, and even for that employer for 30 and 40 years and then retired, right? As I've laid out, the workforce of today is much different, and even life is different. A third of kids born today, by the way, might live to see their 100th birthday. But yet we think of college as this thing that you should do at the age of 18, spend a couple of years doing it, and then moving into the workforce. I think that we should create multiple systems that allow students more time to explore careers in their late teens and early 20s. Because too often, students are picking careers that are familiar to them from growing up, right? What their parents did, what their neighbor's parents did, what counselors and teachers told them to do in school. And increasingly, as the economy becomes more segregated, students only get exposure to a few careers. I heard this over and over again in, in reporting the book, right? Students would talk to me about, well, I picked this major and then I applied for a job a couple of years later. I never knew all these job titles existed, right? And by then, it was kind of too late. We need to move more of that career exploration up earlier and take some students off that conveyor belt that puts them right into, into the job market after graduation. So as I end up here, and, and again, open it up for, for questions, as I was writing this book, I thought a lot about my own life after, after college, right? I graduated college in 1995, and right after, about a week after I graduated, I, I drove with my brother across country to Phoenix, Arizona, where I was going to be on a fellowship at the Arizona Republic, which was the largest newspaper in the state of Arizona. Now, this is 1995, and I walked into the newsroom that first day, and the business editor looked at me, and she said, you're young. You must know something about technology. Our technology uh, reporter is off for the summer on leave. You're our new technology reporter. Now, many of you in this room remember 1995. That was the stone age of technology uh, compared to today. Um, now, 1995 was a year after the first commercial web browser was introduced. And I spent that summer writing stories about the internet, right? I literally wrote an entire story about what the letters WWW meant. I wrote a story about the first airline on the internet, which was Southwest. And at the time, they only had their schedule online. You still had to call up to make a reservation. I wrote a story, an entire story about internet cafes. Of course, these were not places you went to get online as you do today, but places that had desk, those large desktop computers um, to get online, right? Little did I know what I was writing about at that time would have such a profound effect on my own career, right? And the careers of many people and, and the technology that has disrupted so many industries. I had to reinvent myself 
and so will many of today's graduates many times throughout their career. And your job is to help arm them with that ability to navigate that, that ambiguity. Because the degree, once seen as the pathway to a high-skilled, high-paid job, is now increasingly seen as an admission ticket to any job. Now, my wife and I recently moved for the third time in the last 15 years, and we noticed there was this one box that we kept moving from place to place. And if you've ever moved, you probably know there's that box you just move from house to house to house, right? And when I opened it, I finally opened it because I wanted to see what was inside, and there were these two cylinders inside of it. One of them had my college diploma, and the other had my college transcript. More than 20 years after I received them, I had never opened them up. Nobody ever asked for them. But yet these are the two assets that so many students leave college with. It's what we pay so much money for, right? That degree and that transcript. But nobody, almost nobody ever asks for them after you graduate. The main message of there is life after college is that students need to leave with more than just those pieces of paper to succeed in today's workforce. How they go to college matters much more. And so just as I learned to navigate that snowball at Whistler, despite how uncomfortable it was in the absence of all those signposts and those trails that I so desperately wanted from my childhood, today's generation of college graduates are going to need to learn how to navigate the 21st century economy. And they're going to have, and they're going to have the challenging, rewarding careers and great lives that they deserve and that they want. I greatly appreciate your time today, and we have a few minutes for questions or any comments that you have on the presentation. Thank you so much today. So um, I th think we have a few moments for some questions, as Jeffrey alluded to. Um, I'm going to open the floor. I'm looking around for where the microscope, uh, microscope. <laughs> <laughs> you all know what I studied in school, didn't you? Um, the microphone over there. Um, just So if anyone has a question for Jeffrey. Don't be shy. So uh, your speech started, or your presentation started, with a description of how um, outmoded uh, the old education is. And yet, when you talked about the five skills that employers are looking for, they are curiosity, creativity, digital awareness, including the ability to see patterns yep. in large amounts of data, contextual thinking and humility, yep. and that sounds to me very much like a classic humanities education. Yes. So why is it outmoded? Well, for the most part is that in many places, the classic liberal arts education, most pe many institutions and there's pressure from governments in many parts of the world to move away from that, right? To become mm -hmm. more narrowly tailored uh, and, and have that, that, you know, of the T-shaped individual, have that person who is deep in one particular discipline mm -hmm. or one particular subject but not necessarily have the breadth, the foundation, right? So to me, what's outmoded is not the curriculum necessarily, but it's the structure and how we teach, right? It's very much focused on a... Uh, a, uh, a pattern of courses, uh, academic years, instead of uh, project-based or experiential learning, learning that mixes both research and theory, learning that mix bo mixes both work and classroom experiences, so that students, by the way, because it's very bifurcated right now in many places, right? We're student, and I'm not saying that happens here, but in many places, students go to class, and then maybe during the summer, they go and do an internship. And then they come back and they do a class. 
and then they go and do an internship. And they never see the connections between both, right? That ability to transfer learning from one place to the next is a critical skill. That's the contextual thinking that students need and that I think a classic humanities education provides. Oh, I'm a big defender of it, so don't get me wrong. But the problem is, is that we have this either or argument right now. And so we're at the, we're at the extremes, right? We're either saying classic liberal arts and that's it, or we're saying job training and that's it, right? And we're not mixing the two enough. And most important, we're not helping students transfer the learning from one to the other. When I talk to new college graduates, that's the thing they have the hardest point, the hardest thing they have, the, they, the, the thing they can't do is have that narrative about what, what they have done to this point and how that enables them to do the X job, right? They have trouble articulating that, as I am now, um, <laughs> articulating that in a, in a job interview. So no, I, I think classic liberal arts, big fan. Yes, next question. Hi there. Uh, just on the topic of the T-shaped individual, um, I'm just interested in your suggestions on how we deal with the kind of the issue or the gap between uh, deep deep experience and and expertise and uh, new emerging directions in the career in the career market, um, and how we can tackle that right now. So. Um, I guess I'm a little confused by the question. So in terms of like where the job market is going and yeah, how so, you Yeah, so the, the issue of, of new career paths, new yeah. jobs, new directions coming up constantly and those being the ones that are generally the most attractive to students and uh, the most lucrative career paths, how, do you, how, what, how would you suggest um, to kind of help our students bridge the gap between those, those new, new career directions but also employers' desire for very deep expertise and sustained interest? Yeah, I mean, I, it's not an easy, and there's a lot of contradictions in the job market right now. You know, I tell this story in the book about Procter & Gamble, CEO of Procter & Gamble, big fan of liberal arts education. Um, and then I go and I meet a Procter & Gamble recruiter on the college circuit, and she says, well, that's all fine and good that the CEO wants that broad experience, but I'm looking to fill a job tomorrow, and this person's probably only gonna stay in the job for two years. I don't really care about that broad experience. I want them to be able to do this job today, right? And I'm like, wow. This is Procter & Gamble, one of the large, you know, Fortune 500 company that recruits around the world. That is a mixed message you're sending to students. You're, you're telling them you both want that broad and, and deep. Yeah, like a, an example from, I'm, I'm from the IT industry. Um, a, a lot of recruiters will demand two to five years of experience in a technology that just came out three months ago. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Impossible. Impossible, right? And so to me, it's how do you, so, it's, it's can you, and, and of course you don't have the, you can't provide that three to five year experience, but how can you plug in that, that training mechanism? And again, I know that most of your programs here already do that. How can you plug in that training mechanism into a broad liberal arts curriculum? To me is the key, and, that, and that's not happening enough. But the other thing is that you have to explain to students and parents that, and I think that most parents still think college is like it was for them right, where they get that degree, they get that diploma, they go out into the job market and they're ready to go and that diploma's probably gonna be around and good enough for them for a long time. And the fact of the matter is, is that even a year out of college now, you're gonna need to go and get additional training. And so, as an institution, I think you need to start to think for your alumni, how do we continue to keep them connected, not just as alumni, but as learners, right? so that they're, con they're constantly coming out, because they're gonna be looking for places, because employers, by the way, are not gonna necessarily train them all the time. They're gonna need to find this training on their own, and increasingly, they're going to these alternative providers to get it. I think we have time for one more question. I think you're Thank right. You. Okay. Thank you, one more question. So I, uh, I really appreciate what was just said about uh, the, the sort of disconnect between what employers actually want and what they're telling you they want. So we'd like one to two years of experience with a particular product or software or technology, but it just came out two months ago. And so one of the things I've really observed is that a lot of employers really do seek graduates with specific skills and specializations related to a job or task that they're going to perform. And then the nice to have on top of that appears to be these soft skills, the ability to think critically, the ability to engage in continuous professional development, lifelong learning, et cetera. So my question would be, 
where do you see the balance between the sort of large employers taking responsibility for educating their people with respect to the specific requirements they have for their jobs and colleges and universities post-secondary educators preparing students in a meaningful way and the the framework I'd like to uh, to set up for that is uh, for example maybe one company uses a particular software product or technology that is not widely used across the marketplace but seeks graduates with that kind of specific skill set or experience coming from a particular program that a college or university offers yeah I mean unfortunately I, I think employers increasingly are going to be off outsourcing their training to you without necessarily paying for it. On, on the, while I was waiting at the airport yesterday to, to come here, I got a call from a reporter who was working on a story about an institution in Texas that has just partnered with a large payroll processor, ADP, um, to where ADP is essentially designing the curriculum for their HR program, giving them the software, giving them the exact curriculum, and then basically requiring the colleges to teach that this college to teach it. Um, and really what they're doing is using it as a sourcing mechanism for their employees, right? Because now they don't have to pay to do that training. Someone, the student is paying for it in this case. And they now can get the students at the top of that class and they'll hire them as employees, right? So I think this trend is only going to increase. It's unfortunate. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't really think employers should be doing this because what's going to happen in this case for this ADP is that, first of all, that software is going to change in a year or two, mm -hmm. right? The processes, the operations are going to change in a couple of years. Now these students are going to have skills that are going to be outdated in a couple of years, and then who's going to pay for them to get retrained? Not the employer. It's going to be on the backs of students, again, or the backs of employees in this case, and where are they going to have to go to get this training? They're going to have to come back to you, or they're going to have to go to one of these alternative providers. This is, wor in some ways, this is worrisome to me, and I think that colleges need to figure out, like, how can we better partner with employers so that we're not always going to be the place where these students are coming back to to get this training and are going to have to pay for it because I don't think that's sustainable for the long run. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take the time now to thank Jeffrey for spending this morning with us to kick off our um, new academic year. I'd also like to thank him to, for challenging us um, for the post-secondary environment we have right now and how we should think of it differently. We have to prepare our students for success and success will take many different forms after they leave um, our group here. Um, but we have to provide them the platform for lifelong learning. I think that was the most important piece for me. So on behalf of Durham College, I'd like to thank Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Appreciate it.